Great, thank you, Emmanuel and Daniela, for, uh, for organizing this session uh, and inviting us to present here. It's an honor to present to all of you um, about our field, about what we're working on in quantum computing. So we're really excited about quantum computers uh, because we really think that they're gonna help transform uh, what it means to compute um, and what we can compute. Uh, so I'll give you a little introduction uh, around what it means to compute with a quantum computer. Uh, so we've definitely seen an evolution um, and revolution in terms of the types of computers we have. Uh, so we can actually trace back early computers to uh, this mechanism, uh, which actually was used to compute, right? It would roll um, and count in that sense. Um, and that was in 100 BC. And of course, we've seen quite a transformation since then um, from something that's really not programmable uh, towards something that you could begin to ask to do a particular function, uh, right, with Babbage's difference engine in the 1800s, and then um, towards a programmable machine uh, with the ENIAC in the mid-1940s. And of course now, <clears throat> today, we have, you know, large large supercomputers, such as this one that was developed um, in 2012 by IBM. Um, and of course, we have even faster ones than this uh, now today. Um, but the question is, you know, what's going to be the next uh, computing devices and computing machinery that will allow us to do problems and solve problems on them uh, that we otherwise couldn't solve with a digital machine um, with, for example, the Sequoia or the Tiane or one of these fast supercomputers. So are there problems where moving to a new technology, a new way of storing information, a new way of computing, um, are there problems where that actually helps? And of course, we're here to tell you that the answer is yes. Um, with a quantum computer, we hope to solve problems that would take far too long uh, on these other machines. Uh, definitely far too long on a mechanism, uh, but far too long on a supercomputer. So some problems are very hard uh, to solve with even supercomputers. So here is a 2048-bit number. And this number was pulled from the RSA uh, challenge. So if you could tell me the two prime numbers uh, that were multiplied together to achieve this number, uh, then you could win a lot of money. Actually, RSA, I think, used to give uh, something like $700,000 700, uh, if you could actually find the prime, prime factors uh, for such numbers. Um, so this is, this is a hard problem, and in fact, uh, it will thought to be hard, right? So the best, uh, the best. So here, um, this is actually the mainstay of e-commerce today. Every time you put your credit card on the internet, it's being encrypted, encoded, and it's being encoded using RSA uh, encryption. So if you could, you know, say what these two numbers were, uh, then you could really use that uh, algorithm you had uh, to break all of encryption today. Um, that's pretty powerful. And what I'd like to tell you is that a quantum computer can do that. Oh, that ran off the screen. It's 100 seconds, but 10 seconds, that works almost as well. <laughs> um, so classically, uh, if I were to try to solve that problem I just showed you on our supercomputers today, it would take roughly 1 billion years. That's very, har it's very you know, heartening uh, because with putting our you know, all of our information on the internet, I want to make sure no one can actually steal my information. Uh, so this is a nice security guarantee. But then, if I told you, well, actually, we're, we have a, a machine that could break it in 100 seconds, no longer secure, right? So RSA is not secure against a quantum computer. Uh, there is a quantum attack uh, that can break that cryptosystem, and RSA is the number one cryptosystem in use today. It will take, by the way, over a decade to change all of the software that's running RSA. So we need to think about post-quantum cryptosystems now. Uh, here's why. Uh, so with breaking RSA, on the x-axis, we have the number of bits in the key. So we saw a 2048-bit number. Um, on the y-axis, we have the time to factor to find those two prime numbers um, of that n-bit number. 
The green lines represent two possible clock speeds of a quantum computer running Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm is the quantum algorithm that allows us to break RSA. It was invented in 1994 by Peter Shor, who's now at MIT. And the red star represents the 2048-bit number that we just looked at, where you're looking at a billion years classically. So those two uh, yellow identified lines represent the best known classical approach, which is the number, based on the number field sieve. Uh, it's it's sub uh, slightly sub time. Um, but we get an exponential improvement um, between the quantum algorithm and the classical algorithm, thus going from, say, a billion years to 100 seconds. So there's a fundamental different scaling here. And in quantum computing, what we want to identify is where else can we get such improvements, you know, such gaps in the best known classical method and a quantum, quantum approach. So Feynman tells us to look, <laughs> I think everyone has shown this photo during this conference, it's, it's great. I actually select it before the conference, so. Um, but we actually have a real reason to, to, uh, to speak about Feynman. Um, <laughs> um, here, so Richard Feynman, uh, an amazing physicist, right? And he talked about the physics of quantum computers. And most people actually, in reference to quantum computing, speak to some of the talks he gave in the 1980s around using a computer to simulate physics. Uh, but you can actually trace back to his talk even in the late 1950s um, around you know, already he was speaking about computers that could take advantage of physics and alluding to um, actually simulating physical systems on a computer that is based on, for example, quantum mechanics, right? And so that really started thinking around quantum computing. Um, you know, he mentioned information is physical, Matter is made of particles, you have many paths, and we should take advantage of this type of computation, you know, a computer that naturally sits in this large Hilbert space to solve problems that sit in a large Hilbert space. And already today, when you look, so he was talking about simulating physical systems using a quantum mechanical computer, a quantum computer. So already today, when you look at how much, we're, how much compute time we are devoting to simulating physical systems, um, it's, it's a lot. You know, almost half of supercomputing time today is devoted to solving these types of problems. That's a lot of time, and that's only the problems that we think we can solve on a supercomputer. So a quantum computer opens up a realm of possible problems that we're not even trying to solve because we know they're too hard to solve on supercomputers today. So we have a real possibility of opening up a space of problems uh, that are, are already hard to solve and taking a lot of time. So here's an example um, of, what, uh, of what we're talking about. So one example is to find the ground state um, of a molecule, say ferrodoxin. Uh, ferrodoxin is used in uh, energy transport and photosynthesis. And this molecule was chosen by IARPA in a grand challenge recently in terms of costing. You know, what would it take? How much time would it take uh, to find the ground state of this molecule on a quantum computer? Uh, so if we look at this problem, um, the classical algorithm, it's, you know, it's basically intractable. Uh, you're, you can't expect to see the solution to this problem in any reasonable amount of time. It's exponential time to solve this. Uh, oops. On the quantum algorithm, so what's interesting about this problem, um, and this really points to the need for good software, optimization, good compilation tools, um, and good mathematical bounds. Um, the quantum algorithm, you know, there was a polynomial time algorithm for this problem um, for several years. Then, it, uh, in 2012, we sat down and costed uh, the, you know, the time to actually solve this. It's polynomial time. That's great. So everyone said, hey, we have another application of a quantum computer. It's polynomial time. Um, but then you could say, what was the degree? And um, you know, what are you raising to that degree? So the degree is 11, right? n to the 11, and n is typically 100. 
Now, that's a lot of time, and so while this was a practical quantum algorithm, it's not really practical for a killer application. Um, so that algorithm would take 24 billion years, even on a quantum computer, with some reasonable assumption about a clock speed. We actually used software and better mathematical bounds, really do dove into this problem, and the over the course of several years, uh, lowered the degree uh, to something between three and five. So now you're looking at basically an hour to find the ground state on a quantum computer. This makes it more of a killer application. So initial applications of a quantum computer, um, you know, going beyond just, say, the ground state of Faradox, then we can use this to study reaction mechanisms. So nitrogen fixation. We'd like to better produce artificial fertilizer in an efficient way. Something like 3 to 5% of the world's natural gas goes into the Haber-Bosch process, a process you know, invented in the early 1900s, uses large temperatures, large amounts of pressure. Um, you know, it's, it's, in that sense, inefficient. It's using a lot of natural gas. Can we find a catalyst? We know bacteria do this well. Can we find a, a catalyst to make this reaction more efficient? That's a great problem to look at on a quantum computer. Carbon capture is a similar type of problem, looking for a catalyst to help extract carbon uh, from, say, you know, an ambient environment. And then in materials science, quantum computers are great at studying materials. Uh, we want to identify a room temperature superconductor. Uh, we can begin to study, say, the Hubbard model with more sites um, on a quantum computer. Um, and there, you know, that has the potential for, say, lossless power transmission. Uh, and a joke in our field, it has the potential to help us design the next quantum computer. Um, because, you know, if we had a room temperature superconductor, we wouldn't have to put our quantum computer in these cold dilution refrigerators. And then we're also looking at applications of quantum computing and machine learning. Uh, there, uh, we do have speed ups, uh, but one could ask, you know, does using a quantum model of classical or quantum data does that help? Um, and what can we do there? Uh, and we have some early results already, uh, but I'd say this, this work is just at its uh, beginning. Okay, so a quick three-minute introduction to qubits. <laughs> um, so how does the computer work? You know, what's actually different in a quantum computer than in your digital computer, in your laptop, your cell phone? So in your laptop and cell phone and digital, digital machines, we have binary encoding. Everything is a bit. It's in the state zero or it's in the state one. On a quantum computer, you can also achieve superposition. So a quantum bit, we refer to it as a qubit, can be simultaneously in zero and one. Uh, so already you can see that this begins to give you an internal parallelism that you can hope to take advantage of in a quantum computer. So the information is encoded in the state of a two-level, for example, two-level quantum system uh, when it has zero and one uh, superposition. Now this can, in a machine, this could be, for example, looking at the ground and excited states of an atom, um, or you could encode this, say, in the spin um, or in polarization of a photon, for example. Um, so there's several ways, and you'll hear from Sergey. Uh, one technique of uh, encoding quantum information in a physical system. Now we can also compute. So we have this way to encode information. We have a bit classically. We have a quantum bit quantumly uh, that takes on this superposition. Uh, and then we can actually compute. So, you know, classically we think about a logical operation. You might think of it as a truth table. Um, you know, not would be uh, flipping the bit from zero to one and then from one to zero, and you can build up circuits of ands and ors and nots and xors, you know, design your logic um, in that fashion. We can do a similar type of design uh, quantumly, but we have some restrictions. So namely, every operation needs to be reversible, with the exception of measurement. Um, so we need reversible operations, and this leads us essentially to a unitary matrix representing each of our quantum gates. Uh, but we can also perform, for example, a knot gate. And here you can see the matrix representation of the knot, and that vector represents our qubit. So you can, um, you know, in, a, in a layer of abstraction, represent quantum computing as matrix uh, vector multiplies, right? and matrix matrix multiplies. 
If you want to visualize this, a classical bit can be 0 or 1. Um, and we think of a quantum bit sitting on this, what's called the block sphere. So uh, 0 would sit at the north pole, 1 at the south pole. And any quantum operation, a single qubit quantum operation, essentially rotates your vector to a new place on the surface of this sphere. Um, and that's your operation. So I could rotate, for example, if I had a state, a quantum bit in the zero state, I can rotate that halfway down to zero plus one over the square root of two, and that's a gate called the Hadamard gate. Or I could actually flip the bit and do a not operation that takes zero all the way to one, and so on. But the real magic comes in that we can actually build a multi-qubit state, and this takes on a superposition of all of the numbers between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. So here we have 9, you know, for example, 9 qubits. And in 9 qubits, a 9 qubit state, we store you know, 0 and 1 and 2 and 3 you know, all the way up. Um, so all of these numbers are stored simultaneously in this 9 qubit state. And this is where you start to get some of this parallelism. Of course, there's so you know, 250 interacting qubits. To store that would require 10 to the 80 classical bits. So you can begin to get a feeling for how powerful this is. So n interacting qubits uh, would take 2 to the n classical bits of information to store. Um, designing quantum algorithms is challenging. We have a no cloning principle. We can't just copy quantum information. So we have to be careful in how we protect our algorithm, in how we encode our algorithm. Um, and we also have an input-output limitation. Quantum computers aren't great at handling big data, right? They're not great um, at giving you a solution for, say, every page on the web. Um, we have to measure. And this means it's a probabilistic, uh, it's a probabilistic machine. Uh, your algorithm will be probabilistic. So when you measure, you get one of the states uh, with a probability related to its amplitude. Um, so if you want you know, several answers, you'll have to measure several times, or if you want you know, success, you, you may have to run it several times. In general, um, at Microsoft, we also think about programming this machine, and so we actually do have a software architecture that we've developed that allows you to simulate quantum algorithms in advance and optimize them, and this is in part what we use to achieve some of the reductions in the cost in the case of quantum chemistry that I showed earlier, and this is released actually um, on GitHub and allows you to program a quantum algorithm, optimize it, and then um, actually simulate it, and then eventually run it on real hardware. Um, so in general, you'll hear today uh, from our two other speakers, from Sergey and then Aram, um, about the hardware and then also the applications in more detail. Uh, we hope you know, quantum computing uh, will have impact in privacy and security, in energy landscape, as I spoke about with room temperature, you know, the possibility for finding a room temperature superconductor. Um, we should be able to use it to help you know, impact the state of our environment uh, with ways to do nitrogen fixation and carbon capture more efficiently. Um, we're hoping you know, for applications in machine learning. And in general, we envision a quantum computer sitting as an accelerator in the cloud. Right? This isn't something that's going to sit on everyone's laptop. Um, so here's a picture of Charlie Marcus's lab um, and the inside of this dilution refrigerator where the quantum chip sits at the very bottom. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Sergey, who's going to speak more about quantum hardware. Thank you.